on this device. So now we're recording. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for coming. And you notice I created an Outlook group with the Cyber Semiotics 2024 uh, label and added you all, well, everyone that's here at least to that group. Hopefully there won't be too much spam there. And if you don't want to keep receiving those notifications, you can leave the group at any time. Uh, it's for a combination of courses, the Experimental Semiotics and Applied Semiotics. And there is a Moodle for these courses for those who are enrolled. For anyone who is a Palatsky student, Palatsky University student, but not enrolled in the course, I can add you to the Moodle if you're not already there, and that's where the materials will be. But for each of these online lectures, I will provide a recommended reading in the email as an attachment, as I did this week. But I think it's the Applied Semiotics Moodle that has both contents for experimental semiotics as well as uh, for, for the marketing stuff for applied semiotics. So if you're going to choose one Moodle to subscribe to, it would probably be that one. The lecture will be what, half an hour, pretty short. More of a brief discussion of this particular text by Harway which I decided was especially relevant, even though I haven't read it in a long time. And it's kind of gone out of fashion, I guess, or at least in semiotics, particularly in certain fields of semiotics where the technological focus is, well, I guess, discouraged in some ways. Uh, but before getting into the text, so I've taken, I've chosen a couple, I think, cool quotes just from the first chapter. And my approach has been to use my, uh, my tablet here and highlight the passages that I like. There are really only three passages, and, and then I highlight the parts of the passages and I screenshot of them and I put them inside of my uh, inside of my slideshow. And so we'll do a little exegesis of just a few passages of Haraway's work. Um, but first, I would show you just some additions to the Moodle. This is, I guess, the tentative schedule now, as of couple days ago. Previously, it didn't have anything beyond week two. So as you can see here, we're at session two, February 23rd. I got the confirmation from Mark Lemon uh, yesterday that he's good for session three, which is on March 1st. That'll be next week. And so with the, so for, from next week, we're going to do some actual uh, uh, well, what I would call applied semiotics, actual marketing and commercial semiotics lecture. That's what Mark, Mark's specialty is. I got a notification in my window here that my internet connection is slow. So if I'm glitching out, let me know because I can switch to my data. So I've got a, uh, well, I have, I have a backup. So it's midday. It's always midday when there starts to be lag because everyone's online, you know. But anyway, so hopefully there's no problem. So that'll be pretty good. And the reason why Mark's coming back is Mark, as well as Al Deacon, are the only two guest speakers I'm inviting, I have invited back from last year's by semiotics because they were the best and they're the most entertaining. And I think regarding, well, certain certain other matters were, were more in alignment than, than some of the others, but so it should be pretty nice. And, and you can see the rest of the schedule there. Uh, so I wasn't quite sure what we'd do at the end of the semester. I was, hadn't occurred to me really to ask her, but then yesterday it popped into my mind, well, maybe I should ask uh, this professor I know from Bulgaria who is a specialist in like digital questions through the post-structuralist lens, particularly the Chris Staben, Yulia Chris Staben post-structuralist lens, that is Professor uh, Miglena Nikolchina of Sofia University. I texted her and she said, yes. Uh, so maybe April 12th, she's gonna talk to us about Philip K. Dick. And so like sci-fi sci portrayals of the technological singularity. Which is more or less what, what we're talking about today in the context of our ways with this te technological singularity as she perceives it. So that should, should be very cool. It'll be like a redux of the talk that Professor Nicolchina gave to us at the summer school in Prague. And some of you were there. So it's a little glitchy. Uh, thank you, Mariama. I'm liking your, your comment in the chat. Well, hopefully it gets better. Let me know if it gets worse, the glitchiness. 
and I can of course just repeat. So if something glitches out, then definitely like raise a hand and tell me like how long I've been glitched out, and then I'll repeat. I'll go back. And I'll say it again because the lecture will be rather short, so we can just dwell over the points uh, if we miss any. So uh, <clears throat> the book's pretty old. 1986, I guess, was the first version. Earlier version called the uh, Manifesto for Cyborgs, uh, Science, Technology, and Socialist Feminism in the 1980s in a magazine called Socialist Review. How about the version that we read, which is this like first chapter of a book, or well, it's the it's the body text of this of this PDF which I shared. It was actually titled Simian Cyborgs and Women: uh, The Reinvention of Nature with the subtitle, uh, An Ironic Dream of a Common Language for Women in the Integrated Circuit. And uh, we can't help but pause over this qualifier that she adds about it being an ironic dream. When I read it, I don't I don't sense much irony coming from her, but uh, I'll mention this again later in, in connection with, because of course we don't take it entirely uncritically. We're not just like, Promoting it. I chose the text because of its relevance, because of her perspicacity, as well, I'll say, about certain transformations, uh, accelerating transformations. Uh, but without remembering much about it and knowing that in my milieu in semiotics, it's become unpopular. But as I'm reading it again, I'm thinking, well, I agree with practically everything. I'm near, I'm near everything. It just happens that certain like uh, social commitments of hers maybe don't totally align, like with mine aren't. Uh, of the same, quite the same priorities, but nevertheless, it's more or less music to my ears, especially in the way that she characterizes this, what should be the proper attitude towards the, uh, towards the technology, given its like uh, prominence in the organization of every other domain of our lives. That's the idea of the course, so that's why. And I was pleased to see much of it, but we don't take it without a grain of salt, of course. And I think maybe one of our guest speakers talking, not next week, but the week after that, may have something to say about this. Uh, particularly about the human non human distinction. This is, I think, a point of contention. One where I'm kind of like, I have a question mark. Haraway seems to be eager to erase it entirely. Uh, I can tell, but certainly not everyone, even those with the kind of post structural leanings or those who are well aware of the depredations of the digital. Well, uh, may not adopt this. We don't agree on this particular point. But she was nevertheless in, indisputably perspicacious. Uh, perspicacity is your word, word for the day. It's just about being, uh, having a, a sort of keen prediction about the future or, or being pretty accurate about some kind of prediction when she says things like, we are all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are cyborgs. The cyborg is our ontology. It gives us our politics. So per perspicacious perhaps in a number of different ways. Perspicacious about this idea of the loss of the referent in the age of simulation. Of course, I remind them since 1986, it has nothing to do with AI and chat technology as we understand it now, rather than fidelity of simulation and ease of, of simulation and, and thus the increasing increasingly common confusion of the of the representation for the reality this issue of, of simulacra yes she's quite perspicacious about this accelerating phenomenon one which now is more or less impossible to ignore But I would also have done it in the same sense, at the same time as we don't accept this uncritically, I'd also pre not present myself as an expert on her texts by any means, nor an expert on the texts of posthumanism, which are also sometimes put in contrast with those of, for example, biosemiotic. And she's perspicacious on a couple of other points as well. And I, and I think she was perspicacious in the same way as second generation semiology was. And I say that they anticipated the paradigm she had to as I explained last week, and perhaps you watched the video by that title, title Semiology Anticipates the Paradigm Shift.
and the way that she makes the way that she formulate formulates it also is I think perspicacious again once again of the vocabulary that has been adopted by the new materialisms as they're called now which are so in vogue uh, in philosophy today yeah, post posthumanism object oriented ontology speculative materialism etc the way that she was posing it in 86 is already quite a bit like the way that they've chosen to pose it now this may be no coincidence uh given that uh Gilles Deleuze and and Philly uh Gilles Deleuze and Philly Guattari were, were already writing at this time no doubt she was reading them and there's no at least in this first chapter here there's no citation of Deleuze and Guattari there's no direct citation of a number of different you may say the paternities of her of her tradition but this is not an accident on her part so we may assume to listen with her either there in the background when she writes things like that the cyborg is a creature in a post-gender world it has no truck with bisexuality pre-edible symbiosis unalienated labor or other stunctions to organic holes through a final appropriation of all the powers of the parts into it I, I like the, the seductions to organic wholeness. When she talks about the edible, pre edible symbiosis or the creation of Oedipus, she's invoking the book by the title Anti Oedipus by Deleuze and Guattari. An attempt on their part to reformulate psychoanalysis by extracting, well, by, by removing notions of the nuclear family structure uh, from the structure of the psyche, yes, in their schizoanalysis. So perspicacious about the magnitude of the impact of telecommunications development on, on the epistem. Perspicacious about this epistemic shift, which I mentioned last time. Yeah, I don't know, Victor tells us his connection is still bad. You can hear me still, yeah? Everyone's still listening? Give me a sign. Yes. Yes. Great. Anyway, the recording will be via my computer and thus will be unglitched. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, you know, however bad it was, you know, get back on the YouTube and, and like, follow and subscribe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, perspicacious about the epistemic shift uh, in uh, of telecommunications, that is well, what we're not talking about now is mostly social media and AI, but it's also technologies of simulation and, and video fidelity, for, for example, and how they would bring about a situation in which we had to redefine even the most basic words. That's what epistemic shift is. And that's what she means by the cyborg gives us our ontology is because the changes of tech are so profound that our ontology itself has to be revised, I guess. And that means our basic terms, terms like presence. And, but she makes no disguise of the fact of her own post-structuralism, the fact that she is more or less carrying on the post-structuralist tradition. For example, the critique of presence initiated by Derta in of grammatology. And then uh, slides. There we go. So anticipating certain other trends in fiction, uh, for example, from Michelle Welbeck, uh, who uh, certainly does not fall on the same side of the, side of the political spectrum uh, as Donna Haraway and many of these others, but certainly does fall with her in her interpretation of the sort of gravity of the situation of acceleration of info, tech, info and communication tech and the impact that it would have on the social structure. And this, again, it brings it back to the nuclear family, issue of nuclear family in our self-description, as well as the issue of re uh, differential reproduction uh, and posing up the question of how much longer is it going to be the, uh, the primary mode of human, of human reproduction, this reproduction of the, of the species, may be on the way out in her observation. And in this, she's in alignment with a number of other rather extreme theorists. Uh, one author of whom, an uh, anonymous author of, of an online tract called uh, Gender Accelerationism, which we'll read later, which is quite extreme uh, regarding the uh, big transformations underway, having to do something with the end of differential reproduction and techno technological intervention in that in that domain of life uh, and sexuality. And that's what Michelle Welbeck here is narrativizing in, 
in this book and a number of other books, some of which are bestsellers, but they're quite dystopic. And he's doing so in a kind of alarmist way, like he's pretty concerned about it. It may even almost seem like Welbeck would argue would call for a return to traditional values, it seems to me sometimes. And I don't know, though, that's what they say about old Welbeck, but I think he's smarter than that. I do. I read his narrative and I think he's no fool. So he could possibly be so. <laughs> but anyway, you know, people don't like Welbeck very much, but. Uh, we'll read Gender Accelerationism in week eight. It's actually a terrifying text. It's already on the Moodle if you want to look ahead. But we don't, so, you know, on the topic of this extremism, we certainly don't agree with everything. We don't fall in total alignment with this position, or I guess I should just say I don't. Uh, not entirely. I don't accept it uncritically. And the same goes for this. Uh, as I mentioned, and we'll finish on this issue of the distinction between human and, and machine, which Haraway seems comfortable to be er erasing here or saying like, real soon, real soon, we're going to see that this distinction is a leaky one, as she says here. The second leaky distinction is between an animal, human, organism, and machine. She goes on to say that, you know, in the old times, whatever, uh, it was clear that machines only imitated human life, yes, or life, let's say. Uh, but then now we are not so sure. You know. And our machines are so, uh, okay, my little uh, video box is in the way. Okay, our machines are disturbingly lively. We ourselves are frighteningly inert. <laughs> I've been thinking about this, and I, it makes me think of a point I often raise with people who want to again and again emphasize how in how how completely the machine fails to imitate human life at least uh, is that you know maybe you're overestimating the value of human life <laughs> i mean in the sense of the value of human intelligence or the sort of constancy of human intelligence it's possible that in fact like it's, it's i think it's instructive to have the, the thought of experiment about maybe there are times when the humans are even less or there's like less sign ha sign action happen in in the human cultural sphere than there is in in the machine sphere or in the non-human sphere even if this is a, an extreme position. Uh, but anyway, we don't embrace this uh, position, this demolition of the distinction between uh, human and machine uh, so unequivocally as Haraway does, or as the posthumanists do. And I think on this topic, probably Josh is going to have a thing to say regarding the issue of agency. In two weeks, he'll be giving his talk. He may also want to say something uh, today. That's in two weeks, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, but first, we'll have Mark Lemon next Friday. Mark Lemon from Agents of Science Salad. He is a real master. He got his master's at University of Tartu way back in the day. This is a photo of him talking at Semi Osalong about his job at Science Salad way back in 2016. Now, already he graduated, and that was several years after he graduated. But he's still there now. He's a director at Science Salad. And they're one of the most successful branding agencies. And they happen to have a number of radicals among the ranks. Same with, Deke, with Al Deacon, this other guy. That's why I like them. It's because they, they think of their marketing practice as a mode of critique, more or less. More so Al than, than Mark, but both are the real deal in that way. Stopping the recording. First, I'm stopping the share.